We'd like to thank everyone for coming today to our annual service of remembrance. Everyone in this room shares a common bond in that your, holiday is diff your holidays are going to be different this year because someone in your life has died. A spouse, a child, a parent, a friend, a neighbor. Um, and this, it will be different this year. And we hope that you will get some inspiration from our three speakers today and learn how to look at things differently without your loved one in your life. Thursday you had Thanksgiving, it was different. Christmas is coming, it's going to be different. Well, it doesn't have to be a bad different. It doesn't have to be happy and joyous. It's just going to be different. So we hope to offer you some ideas and encouragement on your first holiday season without your loved one. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I have a question for you, and it's simply this. What does the shortest verse of the Bible have to tell us about Jesus? I'm hoping to answer that question for you. And I'm hoping that the answer to that question will bring you uh, some comfort today. Uh, some of you might already know what the shortest verse of the Bible is. Some of you might be wondering what that is. In John chapter 11, verse 35, there's a verse that's just two words long. It just says, Jesus wept. And those two words are in the context of a, a larger story, of course, in John chapter 11. It starts out with the, the passing away of Jesus' dear friend Lazarus, and it ends with Jesus' miraculous raising him from the dead. Well, I'm not going to focus so much on the, the miracle that took place, uh, nor am I going to focus so much on the, the, the theology of this passage. There's a lot of good things in this passage. Uh, one of the ones, um, one of the verses that is used a lot in church is uh, when Jesus told Martha, "I am the resurrection and the life. Um, the one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die." And it's a verse that, that as the church, as Christians, we we hang on to. It talks about the eternal life that those who believe in Christ. Uh, have to look forward to. But I'm not going to get into the theology of that. I want to talk specifically, again, about those two words, Jesus wept, and what they mean for us today and what they teach us about Jesus. So the story begins with Lazarus falling sick. Lazarus was a good friend of Jesus, uh, spent um, many, many hours with Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha. Mary and Martha, in particular, uh, throughout Jesus' ministry, was, was vital in, in all the, the ministry that he did. And Lazarus grew sick, and so the sisters sent word to Jesus, letting him know that the one that he loved was sick. At that time, Jesus was somewhere else. He was ministering with his disciples, and he, he turns to his disciples when he hears the news, and he just simply tells them that this sickness will not end, end in death. Rather, it is for God's glory that this has happened, so that the Son of God might be glorified through it. The disciples were confused. They, they didn't know what was going on. But, but he ended up staying where he was for two more days. Even though his friend was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Finally, he left to go uh, see his friend. By the time he got to Bethany, which is where Lazarus and Mary and Martha lived, Lazarus has already, had already passed away. And he was in the tomb for several days by the time Jesus got there. So Martha was the first one that went out to speak with Jesus. And she approaches Jesus and she says probably similar things to what we would have been feeling at this time. She approaches Jesus and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But then she follows that up with a statement of faith. She says, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. So Jesus then enters into a conversation with Martha, a kind of a back and forth uh, about the resurrection, about Jesus himself, and, and Jesus responds, well, you know your brother will rise again. And Martha answered that with, well, I know he's going to rise again at the last day at the resurrection. <clears throat> and Jesus said, well, I am the resurrection of the one who believes in me will live, 
whoever lives by believing me will not die. Do you believe this? And Martha says, yes, Lord. She says, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. You see, I think Jesus understood with Martha that Martha needed some help processing, making sense of it all. Making sense of Lazarus's death. Making sense of Jesus' hesitation to come right away. Making sense of what she was feeling, what she was thinking, what she believed. And Jesus entered into a conversation with her to help her process those thoughts. To help her process what, she was, go what was going on in her heart and mind in that moment. After that conversation, Martha goes back to her sister and tells Mary, you know, the teacher is here. Why? She, he's asking for you. And so Mary goes to where Jesus was, and, and she makes the same statement that Martha did. She said verbatim, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She doesn't follow it up with a statement of faith saying, oh, but Lord, I, I, God, or Jesus, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. She doesn't follow it up with any of that. She just simply says that statement that there was almost an accusation in that statement. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And, but Jesus handles Mary a little bit differently than Martha. He doesn't enter into a conversation with Mary. He doesn't try to help her process what she's going through. He just simply asks, where is he buried? So they take him to him, and, and it says that Jesus saw everybody who was weeping. And they take him to the tomb, and all it says is Jesus wept. And I think that's important because a, a few years ago, this, this struck me as I was studying this passage. I think Jesus knew that Mary needed something different in that moment than Martha did. Martha needed somebody help, not somebody to help her process through what she was thinking, what she was, the question she was asking. She needed someone to just dialogue with her and walk her through that. Mary didn't need that. Maybe Mary didn't want that. I think Jesus saw inside Mary's heart and knew that at that moment, what she really needed was just someone to weep. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And I think this, this shortest verse of the Bible, these two words, Jesus wept, teach us about, teaches us something about how Jesus comforts us in our grief. In other words, I, I think it tells us that he knows exactly what you are going through. He knows the questions you are asking. He knows the accusations that you might be leveling at God. He knows the doubts that might be creeping into your heart. He knows the times of sorrow. He knows those moments that, that are hardest for you. And wherever you are at, Jesus will comfort you exactly the way that you need it. Maybe like Martha, you need somebody this holiday season to just dialogue with you, to walk walk with you and, and, and ask the questions and, and maybe you don't have answers to those questions but, but just to be able to process together and Jesus might have already sent somebody into your life to process through those things maybe you're, you're at the anger stage of your grief well you know what King David who wrote many of the Psalms in the Old Testament there's a lot of psalms that express a lot of anger toward God. And I think God is big enough to handle it, and I think he's there just simply to listen. Not to condemn you, not to say you shouldn't be angry, not to, to, to kind of back away saying, well, if you're going to be angry, I'm, I'm out of here. But he is there to listen, to comfort, to just simply be there with you. Or maybe you're just where Mary is at right now. You're not looking for someone to come and, and give you words of comfort necessarily. You're not, you're not in that moment where you need somebody to come and, and, and give you those, uh, those statements of faith. Maybe you just need someone to weep with you. As Mark said a few moments ago, as we enter into this holiday season, this is going to be a different holiday than you've ever experienced. Good or bad, it's just going to be different. And there's going to be moments 
when you go through the traditions that you've always done without your loved one, there will be moments that are going to be extremely difficult. That maybe that loss is going to hit you hard. And my prayer for you today, my, my comfort for you today, is know this. Wherever you're at, however you feel coming into these, this holiday season, Jesus knows. And he's willing to listen. He's willing to be there. He's willing just to weep with you if that's what you need. So I, I, I pray, my, my prayer for you is that when you have those moments this holiday season, that you will remember these two words. Jesus wept. And realize that whatever you need, Jesus can provide that for you. He is a God of all comfort, and he is a God of all grace. No matter where you are at in your faith, no matter where you're at in the process of grief, Jesus loves you and is here for you. Because he will. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. He speaks, and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling, but he bids me go through the voice of woe, his voice to me is calling. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tell. Good afternoon. My name is Elena Rose. I'm an account manager with the Grace Hospice. We offer hospice and supportive care in Richardson County. Um, Grace was founded in 1978 in a church basement in Madison by a group of individuals who saw a need for end-of-life care. And from there, the volunteers came together and offered one of the first hospice services in the Madison area. From there, our grace has remained community-focused and community-based organization, focusing on service lines that give back to the community. One of them still being a hospice, which we offer throughout the southern portion of the state. We also offer supportive care adult day center in Madison for memory care patients. 
and we also offer grief services. Our grief services outside of our hospice include community grief, and that's what I'm going to be speaking with you today on. Grief is the feelings we experience as we anticipate and experience a loss or change. And this can be outside of the death of a loved one. This can be any of life's changes. If there's a change in a job, that can cause some sort of grief with the change. If there's a change in a school, a child care provider, maybe a relationship is coming to an end. You might have a new health diagnosis that you're experiencing, or it can also be through a death. All of these changes can ex that we experience, we can feel differently. And one thing a lot of people don't realize is even the small things that we lose in life. Say you drop your cup of coffee this morning, that loss, albeit very small, can add to your stress and that you're carrying around with you. And this idea of compounding grief, where these little things that we lose get to be so much of a stressor. And so one thing that I encourage you to focus on throughout this holiday season is really grounding yourself and realizing what we're thankful for and why we come together. Going through these griefs can take an enormous amount of energy, whether we realize it or not. Changes can evolve over time and we can experience re-grief. So maybe there's a loss that we experienced 10 years ago or something that we experienced as a small child that we experience a new loss and then we relive the old grief again. These changes can become especially overwhelming during the holiday season. But there are things we can do and things we can say to loved ones that are going through grief or to ourselves. Some things that are helpful to say to a grieving person are, I'm sorry you're hurting. I'm sorry this is happening to you. Whatever you're feeling is valid. There's no right or wrong way to go through grief. You can also experience and go through memories with them of a loved one. Talk about happy times. During the holiday season, it can also be especially difficult to go through the things that we normally enjoy doing. Maybe wrapping the presents is extremely difficult this year because that's something that we always did with mom, and mom's not here this year. Or maybe putting up the tree with our children is something that we look forward to and we lost a child this year. These things can bring up really difficult memories and it's okay to change things up this holiday season, to step out of tradition for a year and revisit it, or to change things permanently and move forward and start new traditions. It's okay. There's also ways to plug in in the community. <coughs> Maybe a memory is something that you want to step up and share with other loved ones <coughs> around the holiday table. It's good to talk about things, talk about the elephant in the room, and experience it together. There's also things that you can do to help a grieving loved one. If they're struggling, we all want to say, let me know if you need anything. But it can be even more helpful to specifically say, let me come walk the dog for you. Let me make you dinner tonight. Or they might have requests for you. I need help doing a chore this week. I need help picking up the children from daycare. And that's something easy that you can commit to and if it's not, it's okay to tell them no, but then offer them other things that you can help them out with as well. Find ways to support them as they go through this change. And don't be afraid to ask for support if you're the one needing it this holiday season. A Grace also offers community groups that you can visit either in person or virtually. We have a grief center in Fitchburg that you can go to and it's specifically a building for grief. So there's different rooms designed for children, designed for teens, designed for one-on-one -on -one sessions or group sessions to get what you need out of the resources. If you're looking for individual 
um, grieving groups, we can have our community grief counselor come to you and speak either with families or with a specific group of people. If there's been a loss in a school or a loss in the church community, we can come and have a specialized one-on-one -on -one session for, excuse me, for that loss as well. One thing I encourage you to do throughout this holiday season is to sit back and reflect, ask for help when you need it, and take it one moment, one minute, one hour, and one day at a time. Reasons. 
Two years ago, I lost my grandmother on Christmas Eve. So as I'm sitting here and I'm listening to the service, I'm reliving it. But uh, Alana, Alana, you said if I start crying, that's okay, right? That's just grief. She said that's it. She's a professional. So if I if I start crying, well, then we're all in this together. And there's a couple things about losing my grandmother that taught me some amazing lessons. One is there's a whole wealth of people out there with a lot of really good intentions that want to say the right thing when we're hurting. And they can't. I got a lot of texts and a lot of calls, and none of them was particularly helpful. Their intentions were good, but what I found a lot of help with and a lot of comfort in was the family that was around us, those of us that shared in that life. Because in order to work your way through grief, you have to know, you have to share those memories and share that grief. And Mr. Jelinek said something that was pretty smart. He said that these holidays coming up are going to be different because the people that we love aren't here. Now, before I start crying, I'll tell you about Grandma's cookies. Because we all... We all have somebody that we lost. And each person that we lost that brings us together has something about them that we love. So I'll talk about Grandma's cookies. Because Christmas, it's hard to picture Christmas looking back over my childhood with all my grandma being a, a central figure, right? And I knew that Christmas was getting close. She, well, she always, she's a farm grandma, right? She had cookies. But when I go over to her house on those special days when they were getting closer to Christmas, why, there was an extra helping of cookies, and there was these wreath cookies. And uh, you couldn't get enough of them. And Grandma always bought the best presents. And her house was always decorated the best. And she always had time. Christmas and her were, you couldn't separate. And I still can't. And that first Christmas after Grandma was gone, it was different. But like Mark said, you know, holidays are going to be different. But maybe not as different as what we think. And here's what I mean. I miss Grandma tremendously. And whoever you lost, you miss as well. But what is it about that person that we love? What is it about that person that we remember? What is it about that person that we've learned that we can carry forward? And maybe it was, wasn't Grandma's cookies, they were great, but it was the time that she spent with us and the love that she showed us. And perhaps that's what we can give to the future generations moving forward. And maybe Christmas doesn't have to be quite so different. But today in church, we lit the first candle of Advent. Today is the, the first day of Advent, and it's the countdown to something. And again, it takes me right back to Grandma's house. Because I didn't know as a kid what those candles meant, but I knew the white one meant I was going. And I was going for Christmas dinner and presents. And that's all I needed to know. Because for the, the kids out there today, church wasn't always the most exciting place as a kid. But, but uh, it was an important place. And as we go through this season of Advent, today we lit the candle of hope. And one of the things about my faith that gives me tremendous amounts of hope is that Jesus Christ came down. They called him Emmanuel in the Gospel of Matthew, which meant God with us. Pastor Young, beautiful story that he told, 100% relevant for today. Jesus wept. We don't worship in the Christian faith a God that's a million miles away and doesn't understand exactly what we go through. We worship a God that came down here, who knows what it's like to cry, who knows what it's like to be hungry, who knows what it's like to suffer, who knows what unfair things truly are. And he's walked through that, and he's waiting with his arms out 
to bring you comfort. I want to share a, a passage of scripture. It's from the Psalms. The older I get, the more I appreciate the book of Psalms. You know, I put a lot of faith in this book because so much of it could have been written just yesterday when it was written, you know, two, three thousand years ago, some of it more than that. But it's so relevant to today. But if you pick up the Psalms and just start reading it, you're reading stories written years and years ago that may have been written about you and your situation today. There is a ton of comfort to be found in the book of Psalms. And there's just a couple verses from Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. The psalmist is telling us that our help, our comfort, comes from God. That he's waiting to give us that help and that comfort. And that he never sleeps. He'll never forsake us. And he'll never leave us. So before I close up and go back and sit down, there are no magic words that can take away the hurt. There aren't. We work through that grief together. But I think that what I said about Christmases and holidays being different, but maybe not quite as different as what they, you think they may have to be, rings true. Because that hurt and that pain that I feel, and I know that you feel, the loss of a loved one, also means that they had a life well lived. It means that they did things right. That they left a hole in your life and in mine. And I think that knowing that our days are numbered really helps every day be special. So in church today, we started a season of Advent. We have 28 days from now till Christmas. 28 days, four weeks. So during these four weeks, whatever lessons that the people that we've lost, if they could come back and write us a letter telling us how to live these next 28 days. My challenge to us today before we leave is, what would that letter say? And how can we bring their memory to life right now in us? to keep that tradition alive one more year for our friends and our family. Thank you so much. Once again, we'd like to thank everyone for coming today. Um, and especially thank you to Pastor Jonathan, who wanted to let us know that it is okay to cry. It's okay to cry this holiday season. And Elena for letting us know it's okay to make changes and to ask for help. And Pastor Jason for reminding us to have hope and remember our loved ones. And for David and Juan for saying thank you. On the back of your program, speaking of remembering, is a poem that my wife wrote a couple of years ago. She doesn't like taking credit for it, but I think it's very good. It says, remember them this Christmas. Remember your loved one this Christmas. Allow your grief to mend your heart. Grieve in your own way, in your own time. Everyone grieves, but not everyone grieves the same. It is okay to feel angry, sad, lost, and alone. Your life will never be the same without them. But nothing you do in the future will change your love for the person who died. Remember them this Christmas with tears and perhaps a smile. Take a moment for yourself to look towards the wondrous Christmas sky. Up front on the tree is a ribbon, and on that ribbon is written the name of everyone that we had the honor to serve in this last year. In a couple minutes, we're going to have you come forward. We're going to give you the, your loved one's ribbon.
when you do come forward, if you can remind us of what your loved one's name is, which will help us to find the ribbon. There's one ribbon for everyone, but if you would like more than one, or for people that maybe were at another funeral home or died more than a year ago, Darren and Deanna are going to be on this table over here on the side, and they will make you as many ribbons for your loved ones as you would like. Also over on the side are some refreshments that my son Carter will be over there to help you out with. Feel free and take some home, but remember your loved one this Christmas. Say their name. Remember them. And hopefully this Christmas we've offered you some support and ideas of how to make it okay. Maybe not better, but okay. Thank you. We're going to start right up front and just come up and we'll help you with your list.